Buenas noches a todos. Estamos Good evening, aquí. everybody. One, one or two more minutes waiting for all people that are coming in to get connected and then we'll get started with the event. And while we wait, we'll tell you that we're going to be making questions and comments and at the end of the talk, be taking questions and comments. And for those who are interested and would prefer to listen to the talk conversation in English, we have simultaneous English translation available. In the Zoom link, you click on the translate icon for those who want it, and then you choose English. As well. And those who are joining us, welcome. We're going to wait one more minute. Good evening. For all those who are just getting connected, we're going to start very shortly. Maybe a few more seconds wait to let some other friends join us who are joining us as we speak. Okay, let's get started. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this event. I'm Dr. Isela Carlin, I'm the curator of the Rollins Museum of Art at Rollins College here in Central Florida, close to Orlando. I feel very honored to have you with us this evening, and particularly to have our guest artist, Rafael Trelle, who will be having a conversation about his exhibition, The File Trey is the Imagined Word, which opened on September 18th at our museum and will be until December 31st of this year. This includes 15 drawings that explore the connections between art and universal literature and highlights a multidisciplinary approach to artistic creation, which characterizes Rafi Chayes' work. This has been possible thanks to the promised town of A. Johnston, of art and distinguished artist in the Front Rollins College. This ex exhibition is part of the Rollins Museum of Art Initiative, which we started in 2019 to develop a projection of Puerto Rican work in our museum, which is located in the Orlando area and where there's a large Puerto Rican community. We have the purpose of having our artists represented in our halls with exhibitions like this and as part of our collections. The museum has been actively collecting and exhibiting Puerto Rican artists from the island and from the diaspora over the last two years. Rafael Trelles was one of the first artists that we selected to add to our collection. In 2019, we acquired his work, The Autopista del Sur, which was inspired in the story by Julio Cortaza with the same title. This acquisition has been a significant addition to the museum's collection, which is an academic institution has had professors and students of various disciplines and incorporate them into class discussions and then setting the opportunities to have educational opportunities through art. This exhibition that we're talking about today is the first individual exposition of a Puerto Rican artist in our museum. It's perfectly located within 
our academic vision and the approach to our surrounding communities. This evening, I'm very pleased to introduce Rafael Pérez, who has been highlighted in Puerto Rico's artists and has contributed to the education and the arts. Born in Santurce, Puerto Rico, in 1957, Pérez has a BA in arts from the University of Puerto Rico, as well as graduate studies at the Escuela Nacional de Artes Plásticas in Mexico, he also studied with paint, Catalan painter Julio Tor, and he continued his studies in the Canary Islands where he risked for a while. He's characterized by a unique technique which is reflected in any of the mediums in which he works. Painting, engraving, installation, performance, drawings, we'll see this evening and his calls magical realism, surrealism, and es esoteric art also. And Puerto Rico is a place of convergence in Puerto Rico and inspiration for creation of works that have universal resonance. And there also has collections that are located in and out of Puerto Rico. He's received prestigious awards among them. The medal of culture of the Alegría Foundation 2011, from the Center for Academic Excellence from the University of Puerto Rico. The medal of the art from the Puerto Rican Association of Graphic Artists affiliated to the UNESCO among many others. He published his first book of poetry in 2015, and in 2019, he was selected unanimously to the Puerto Rican Academy of Spanish Language. Before passing the microphone to Rafi, I'd like to say who worked with us to bring this exhibition here, particularly, of course, I want to thank Rafi Trenes, who received us one morning in his shop before the pandemic to show me the drawings that are included in this exhibition and to tell us about he tell me about each one. And it's my pleasure and my honor to welcome Rafi Trey. Welcome, Rafi. Thank you, Gisela. For me, it's a huge pleasure. Thank you for such generous words. It's huge for me to be exhibiting in the museum. Unfortunately, I couldn't be there for the opening, you know, due, of course, to the precautions that I'm taking with regards to the pandemic. But thank to you, to the director, and to the board of directors of the museum for welcoming me to such beautiful halls as you have, such as the Rollins Museum Hall. I want to thank Laura Galvan for all the work that she's done coordinating this exhibition. I have a series of images that I want to share to the friends who are with us this evening, and thank you all for being with us this evening. Rafi, I'd like to start with the image mentioned the, the, the exhibition of the painting. So I'm going to show it so those who don't know, which is how it's kind of the, in, the first introduction, one of the first works by a Puerto Rican artist, which we've exhibited in the museum, which also inspired in a literary work. And even though it's not in the exhibition that we're going to discuss tonight, I want to share it with those who of us with those who are with us and then move into the topic at hand which is the exhibition and i would like to ask you if you could tell us a little bit how is it that this series of drawings emerge this is a series which encompasses a greater number of, of drawings that we have in, in, in our hall there, we have 15 but the series is more than that these drawings are after Hurricane Maria. I was kind of lost after the hurricane. I had these papers that were left over. These papers, Stonehenge, crack color. It's called very much like cardboard. We artists like these intermediate grays because it allows the tone with light and shadow. I decided just to start working, kind of like to warm up and, and, and distract myself from the situation we were living through. And I was working faces, which were really in, like 
would you like to work? I say faces, looks, and then gazes. And then little by little, one of them, Nick Bottom reminded me, uh, Midsummer Night's Dream is a character who's transformed into a donkey. And from there is where it came to my mind to start. I had, then I did another one, which kind of the term, you know, another one from the Thousand and One Arabian Nights. I decided to work on a series based on characters from literature, but it was based on memory. They started to come to mind, the memories of works that I had read. This collection was done completely from memory. Most of the work that I did were based on images in memories that I had of literary works that I had read. And I decided not to go back to them. So it would be the imagination, it would be the filter, which in one way or another would allow me to create works that aren't you know, illustrations or drawings uh, of the literary, but rather visual gestures, a dialogue with the literary text. That's the general idea. And while you're working on these drawings, you work on one and you work it through, you, or do you work at several one at the same time? Usually, I work on one and I don't leave it until I'm done with it. You can have more than one painting, but usually in, in these, in these it was sequentially, one after the other. Now, in terms of literature, topic that's very linked to your artistic creation, obviously you are an avid reader. I mean, aside from that literature, not just Caribbean and Puerto Rican literature, but also world literature, informs a lot of your work. Can you tell us a little bit about that? One of the things that really caught my attention when I started working with Laura to bring the sample up here was the fact that you incorporate authors, let's say, from the canon of universal literature, Shakespeare, Kafka, and others. And you also integrate authors who, even though they're known in Puerto Rico or the Caribbean, are perhaps not part of that universal canon when people talk about world literature or universal. Can you tell us about that? Because there's a lot of intentionality in the selection of the texts. Well, part of the question about the literature, literature has come up as part of my formation and interest in humanism, and it's been part of my formation. Figurative artists, we have that task also of not just working a painting or a work of art. If it was abstract, it just be the formal act. But figurative artists also, we have the need to say something with our images. And so particularly, I'm interested in narrative painting. That is why sometimes when I work on a piece, I get the memory of some something I read, could be a myth, it could, or it could be a literary work. In the beginning, I used the traditional method learned at the academy. An artist decides to paint, make a painting, you elaborate the idea, then you work on some initial drawings, and then you go to the painting. When I started to work like that, what happened? I got very repetitive, and I was frustrated because the plastic solutions and the images went to started to be too similar. And one of the things that I started to do to kind of avoid that and get away from that habit was to work on the tracing technique, which is invented by Oscar a, 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 a painter from the Canary Islands in the 30s. They say Victor Hugo did it before him, but he's the one who updated it and brought it. Now, and that, tech, that technique of calcomania, I want to be able to explain, is the classic artist starts with a spot. You, you start with a rag or piece of paper on wet paint and, and lift it up, and that initial stain serves as the starting point for the artist to be able to visualize on this stain 
and then and elaborate his work from there. When I started to work with this technique, which was back in 91, I first did it years before that, 85, 86, I started to work on that. But when I started with this, as I said, with this technique, what happened was that when I looked at the stain and visualized the image, then in that creative process, images would come to me that I re that related to re or readings that I had done. So little by little, that started hasn't really been totally intentional for me to say, okay, now I'm going to make a painting on, based on Kafka and then paint the work. It was the other way around. The image itself and the creative process is the one that little by little would take me to a memory of some figure that would come to mind. We'll think like from a character in a particular work of literature. And then, and then there's a balance between reason and intuition in, in the end for the result to be a work of art that's well done and is balanced. In the group of drawings that I have now, it started with a similar process. Well, there wasn't a stain as such. And as I was explaining, I started with a face. It was a random face in the imagination which led me to the literary work. Then afterwards, when it was clear to me that I was going to have a series of works on literary topics, that is when I started to say, well, I want to do something on Kafka, for example, and start to work on the face, and then start to think on in the work itself and think of the literary work. And, and then little by little, you start building it, using your imagination as the primary tool. You start to build the image. When you look at these works up closely and spend some time with them, just looking at the faces, and it's happened to me on several occasions, we've been in, in the hall, and with a colleague from the museum or somebody who's visiting from the community, the comment is these faces, they have such level of detail in terms of specificities that it would seem as they were inspired by real people, many of them to work on them. I start from a photograph, for example, a photograph of friends of mine, or Gitano, Gypsy, for example. There's a friend of mine, Roberto Thomas. I've taken several pictures of him, photos of him years ago, and I resorted to one of those. And they have little stickers as one, as a friend of my granddaughter's who came here. I saw her face. I saw her, she looks like a little Mexican girl. And in other cases, for example, characters that I used for this reign of this world. I used some photos from the internet and some historical photos of an anthropological type. And so then I used a photograph. Generally, I don't expect it to be too much like the original, but I just get information regarding lights and shadows, the contrast, and those anatomical details. It, I really enjoy it. It's all, it's all an excuse to draw. Very well. The image that we have up on screen for that title and with the image that represents Black Majesty from Palais Matos. I was commenting the other day, some in the museum, even though the poem by Luis Maris Matos is well known to me from all my life, of course. Having been born and raised in Puerto Rico, but I had never visualized it. I had never had an image for myself that would represent what is the, the poem talks about. And your work then gives shape to that in a very particular way, which in contrast with Miriam, which we put closer, it's an interesting contrast also in terms of the other visions that these authors present, and of course, the cultural contrast. In the case of Pales Matos, Pales Nato was a very important writer in Puerto Rico. He was the one who inaugurated in the Caribbean what they refer to as Black poetry. 
And he decided to rescue the African culture, Afro-Puerto Rican culture, at a time when Puerto Rico wasn't even considered as a culture, it didn't give value to it. And he decided through the use of the language above all and the rhythm of his poetry, he decided to develop all of this black poetry they have. And he uses words of African origin or even made up words, which have a rhythm that's very, very Afro, with, that's within the Afro-Caribbean tradition of speaking. And so what I try to do with my drawings is exactly what he did. Uh, kind of take us back to Africa instead of painting or drawing a woman that's walking through a street of the Antilles. What I did is a representation of a crowned African goddess spent with a tribal origin, kind of seeking those African roots. And this ha this happens with a lot of the works also. The spectators looking for illustration or references that are very accurate to the literary work, they're going to be get very frustrated. But in so I, in some cases, I go on a tangent or I get into an argument with the author because to, in, in one of the central themes or the Perhaps the central theme of this exhibition, I'm pointing toward in the title. The title is The Imagined Word. I'm already establishing with the title the relationship between the reader and the author. In this case, the word is the literary word imagined, is imagined by me, by the artist. And that re dynamic relationship is a complex relationship between the reader, I mean, and the literary work of the reader and the author. And, but it's been studied in the last decade in literary theory. And I remembered, for example, we might remember the essay Open Work by Humberto Eco and other like Roland Barks has got also an important essay on the death of the author. Both authors speak to <coughs> an active reader that the work of art <coughs> has to be an open work. It's paradoxical. Because you're creating a structure which is coherent. But at the same time, that structure has to allow the reader or the spectator to be able to appropriate that work and be make it his or her own and take it somewhere else, take it to another. So this then becomes becomes an active observer who can play and interpret and interpret the work in a way in which the author had never imagined. And in that sense, that's what I did. Each one of the drawings is an interpretation that's totally personal. And if Roland Barthes said that for the reader to be born, the author had to die. I think this exhibition in some way or another, I say kind of jokingly, right? This is a massacre of authors. <laughs> it's very interesting, Rafi, these images. With few exceptions, we'll get there when we look at the images. But in the case of Miriam, which is up on the screen now, if the observer has not read the story of Miriam, that it has so much intensity that it really grips you, her gaze. And when you read it, then obviously we have another dimension that invites it to reflect. And as we say in English, to, to engage it with the work. With the, for example, of Camafeo, which you include there, you leave the image is not completely formed. You don't give the observer all the details. Exactly. Exactly. The work is unfinished. The work is unfinished. And that's a subject that I've been very interested in because one is contemporary sensibility so interested in, in unfinished things. It's something that's very interesting. I've been thinking, why does this happen? It might have to do with this sense of uncertainty that we have nowadays. Even quantum physics, there's a uncertainty principle. 
and postmodern thought also has made us uh, distrust reality. And so nowadays, the human, contemporary human being loses a lot of distrust in things that are finished. So there's a thinker, what's his name, Nicolas Moro, who has said, only we allow artistic objects to be unfinished. Industrial products or products can't be unfinished. So what's unfinished is is a quality which intrinsically belongs to art. We value, praise great value, say, by way of example, Rembrandt's paintings. He was a marvelous artist. And we see them as, as finished works. However, we know that Rembrandt did not do it with that intention. It was always a search. And he was, however, nowadays, we interpret them as finished. And in the case of these drawings, of course, the reference to the text, which as readers, we mean activate and complete the stories that we read because we imagine them in our own way, bringing our own experience to it. That's where it is. The fact that it's unfinished allows the spectator in a, in a certain way to finish the work. And he's a co-creator with the artist. And that's part of the intention. Anko also spoke about the work in movement. These are works that, by being unfinished, are in a transition, are in a process through time in which they're going to be finished when the spectator finishes it. And this quality is more present in, in, in some than in others. In some cases, that quality is present that you have to observe. And one of those cases is the rhinoceros which is one of the pieces in the exhibition, and we'll see it on the left. And that one, that specific end, you have to make the effort to look at the details to realize that it's not completely finished, that it's not giving us all the information, all the visual information, that, that perhaps it might give us it was an illustration. So leaving that open for the observer. It's also good at this point to point out the, the role played by blank spaces and the negative space and work, which is very important. Not just because I use the color from background as an intermediate tone, which you create these tonal scales from white to black using that was one of the backgrounds as an intermediate point, but also because many times this blank space it plays an important role in the composition. In our work like Ana Karenina, we want to see if there's a blank space in the bottom, perhaps too large. You go, oh my goodness, what's going on here? What happened? The artist got tired or something? <laughs> but no, this is on purpose, specifically, really, to create uh, a tension. There's the influence also of the Oriental. Mark. I have mentioned what I've learned from from Chinese and on Japanese and other uh, artists from the Orient. It seems perhaps a point thinking about the reading when we read a book that's not in a traditional format, say like a book of poetry, perhaps phrases which take up a whole stage, but leave an entire blank space which let the uh, reader ruminate. Exactly. But there's other part of the exhibition, and I wanted to ask you, I'm sure some of the people who have seen this in Puerto Rico or have already been to the museum, there's other cases like the one from Casca, its representation in this piece, it looks a lot more finished a large number of details compared to the other. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, the thing is, each drawing has a, has, is a process, is an individual process. And I started to work, and then the plastic ideas start to come up, and you have to respect the process and give the drawing what the drawing is asking you for. In this specific case, it was a little more difficult to leave areas unfinished. But if you look at the, the shoe, there's a touch of humor. And the, 
this shoe, that shoe, the giant shoe gives it a bit of humor. The technique of the spatula takes you in a direction and things that are a little looser. It's based on a picture of Kafka. If there's a little bit of irony there, too. You can see there are work like this. Even though it's included in this exhibition, you still consider it a drawing? Somebody was commenting about that the other day in the hall. But some of these could be considered paintings because of the materials that are used. Yes, the thing is, nowadays, as you know, the boundaries between the different mediums of the blend and our, the artists work with freedom. So I, I always say, I, we say they're drawing because they work on paper. There's also an economy of color, they're more tonal. The colors are reduced to blacks and browns. In some cases, there might be some blues, but this is just hints of color. But if you consider a painting as perhaps a hybrid state, and they might point to in the creative process, perhaps the next paintings in somewhere or another might try to explore these solutions. Uh, but then on the canvas, it's not easy when you change. Uh, materials have, have certain idiosyncrasy, and they dictate a lot to what the artist can do. Material, the artist has to respect the materials. Also play in the case of this one, of the metamorphosis, there's some qualities. You know, there's a quality a little bit ethereal, very evocative in the representation of the wings, exactly, yes. There's a flow here in terms of the colors, the composition, and the depth. You pointed out something that's important, because composition is not just built on the basis of the form, the balance, the type of shape and planes, but also it's based on the texture. This exhibition, you can read the whole thing as a composition. Each work, you're going to see that various areas of the drawing have different textures, which are put at play to create tension with other textures from areas of drawing. Here, what you're seeing here is you see transparency and the delicacy of the wings. In contrast, the, the work of the abdomen and the body of the insect, which is very different from the texture of the skin, which is another texture. You're going to see again the leather texture, the leather and the shadows produced by that. So you can see there's textural compositions where you see your minimal work. I'm trying to say the most with the with the with the minimum. There's a lot of economy of media mediums. So with this limitation, self-imposed limitation of the medium, I'm trying to get the most out of it. And in that sense, in that context, textures are a fundamental element. Also the color, the quality of paper also helps to highlight that distinction of textures, right? That you achieve with the material. Exactly. The paper already gives me an atmosphere. When I face the paper, it's not already white paper, it's already a tone. It's a warm, grayish tone. So it gives me an atmosphere to, to work from there. And as I said at the beginning, I'm in, in, uh, citing what was done in, since the Renaissance and before then, in the Middle Ages, a lot of times artists started with a general tone that allowed the artist to then work with lights and shadows. One of our friends was with us tonight is commenting that the images weren't being shown on screen. I hope they are now, so we can share a screen. So if they're not being seen, let me know. Okay, we're now supposed to be able to be seen. There we go. I want to take advantage of this opportunity to thank you 
and your entire team for setting up in the museum who made decisions as the design of the way it was set up because it was spectacular. It's not gonna thank you. We wanted to set it up in such a way that the drawings would stand out. People wouldn't pay attention to the walls or so the walls just kind of recede and what jumps out at you are the drawings. And also, we played a little bit with the closeness, proximity between one drawing and the other, the way we distributed and worked with Lauda on that to distribute the paintings in the different malls that represent the tradition that some of these wor works represent. The region or distinction of cultures and create contrast in different ways and kind of generate a conversation between one work and the other. And here we have the mentioned earlier, the one of the Nicholas and Anna Karenina form an interesting contrast. In the case of Anna Karenina, the, the unfinished quality is very palpable. Yes. That one's particularly based on a painting by Kosov, who's a Russian painter. Kosov painted the most accepted, well known, and version of this character of Anna Karen. Kosov represents her with this imperial dress, long, long gown. I uh, omitted all of that. And she's there, kind of disappearing or appearing, emerging, could be. It's interesting because if you notice, on the left upper part of the drawing, there is a stamp, there's a, there's a stamp of a bit of a traditional uh, type of uh, traditional needlepoint, and I stamped it with taint on the paper. And when I stamped it, I felt that it needed something. I started to work on it and do like a make of organic forms that came up. And I told myself, well, this has nothing to do with it. I got any no, with the work. But I just continue working on it. And then it's curious, when we started to look for the quotes, the quotes that accompany the books were searched for. Some of them were found by me and others by Laura Galvan, who helped me out on this task. And she started to go through the texts. <clears throat> so the, the quotes adapt to the drawings for the same reason we're talking about, that these are not illustrations. These are rather visual texts that dialogue with the writer. So if you'll notice the quote, which is under, talks about a son, his lover, of an so I get out of the train and when he see her, sees her, he thinks she's like the sun, which is shining. And so that image in the back acquired an entire different sense in the context of the quote and alludes to the sun itself. It's very interesting because this thing that we were talking about regarding the relationship between the reader and the and the literary work in the case like Ana Karenina, Golem, and these works that are here in this collection, these are works they have been read so much and become part of popular culture. They have been revisited many times. Movies have been made about them. They're, they're, they're cultural products. This phenomenon has now become then something which is to the extreme. Ana Karenina. People now know the movie rather than the novel. So it's this phenomenon that we're experiencing in this such an audiovisual world. And the number, I think it's fascinating, multiple levels of approach in an image like this, where you say you mentioned the image 
del bordado puertorriqueño of the Puerto Rican needlepoint work and also the, the painting by another artist, the representation of this other artist and its confluence. You know, various artistic expressions, visual, literary, etc. Reference, there's different references. Yes, and there's a confluence which is suggested there, which is either emerging or disappearing. But there's a lot of space for the observer then to be able to complete it. So here it's good to talk a little about the technique. You're going to see that the faces and other very delicate parts like the hand I worked with a brush, all with graving ink. Why do you use graving ink? Because it's oil. It's oil which has a dryer drying it, so it's designed to be applied directly on the paper, and therefore it has a drying element which makes it dry fast, and you don't have a, a oil stain. I already use regular oil paint for a traditional painting. I run the risk those areas that you create a, a oil stain, and to avoid that, I use grabbing tape. And so the delicate part, as Giselle said, I used brush, which is called dry dry brush, dry brush, which is applying the brush sideways and using it very delicately so there's no you think that there's brush no at the same time as you use a spatula sometimes for example little Stigo's hair the person on the left is done with a brush it's a brush that has a lot, it's loaded with paint, as if it were a spatula. Or with a spatula itself, where you can see the Ana Karina's dress was done with spatula, leaving a lot of areas completely bare. In this particular one, Ana Karina, it's practically unfinished. Uh, I, I hope you enjoy it. Just a, a question comes to mind when I look at some of the other works here in the in the hall. You can always see the relationship between them. And now we can move into close-ups and look at them individually in detail. You mentioned that you're not just reading these works while while you're doing the drawings. These are these are works that you've read over the years and just that have remained in your mind and you remember in some way. And they one would in some way inform what you're going to be doing in your drawing. But well, once the drawings are made or done, does it change your perspective on the text? Once you finish, for example, he died. Does it change your perception that you had of these 100 years of solitude? Well, really, no. I, I don't think that happens. What does happen is I'm the first one that's kind of surprised. When I read 100 years of solitude, I never in my mind had these images. And when you read a literary work, you visualize as you're reading, depending on the reader's or the writer's ability to provoke these, create your mental images. But these are works where most of them I read so long ago that really when I, I'm more really painting the memory. And I do it even intentionally because the memory, uh, instead of pro uh, getting me closer to the work, it, it distances me from it. It's a filter. We're seeing is my inter particular interpretation of the work, of the literary work. So don't expect that you're going to find there what the authors meant. Say, for example, Garcia Marquez, but, but it's just here you see, for example, these spheres, these, these colored circles, which is 
This is totally apocryphal. It's kind of outside the traditional of what the reading of Garcia Mike is. I wanted when I painted this character and put the hat on, which my friend's photo didn't have. So I like the image, but it's too much uh, too typical. I wanted to introduce an, an element that would bring it to the contemporary period, but at the same time, which would make a reference to Gitano, particularly to Mercedes, who's the main one, one, the most important one in the novel. And uh, he worked with the various planes, he was able to transform one thing into another. So the way to suggest the different planes was by using the scale of circles of different colors. But I'm, I'm telling you this, I'm possibly surprised because the reader, if I don't tell them, they probably wouldn't make that interpretation of those circles. But I'm really not interested in people necessarily understand what I'm saying. I'm interested in the work provoking a meaning. So sometimes some of my works, I have my own inter personal interpretation. A friend of mine or someone else has come to their mind. They have a very personal interpretation of it, and I like it better than mine. And after that, I use that one. <laughs> That's what it's about. The amazing thing about art, which allows that interpretation. One thing that caught my mind in the collection and the works which are included in the sample is that many of them, not all of them, but many of them, uh, take on the subject of transformation. And there's transformation of the characters, or transformation in terms of the identity. In this case, you have transformation, complete transformation. But there's a space gap, one identity and the other. This moment of transition, could you please approach that? Yes, that's a very important fact. First of all, that's personal affinity. I'm very interested in mythology. And myths, a lot of time talk about this, about transformation and that integration of the human being with nature, with the plants, animal. This is all in the Latin American roots. You know, what you see on the screen is a trilogy based on Alejo Carpentier's Kingdom of This World. He's a very important Cuban author. And he wrote this novel. It's interesting because this novel, the prologue of the novel, he introduces a concept which is fundamental for the boom of Latin American literature. It was a concept of the mar marvelous. That's where magical realism comes from. Carpenter said that Latin Americans, we don't need like the surrealists or like the Europeans to resort to the unconscious to find an alternative reality to, to one of reason. Because surrealism was a movement which rebelled against the, the ex ex excessive rationalism of the West. And he looked at Freud's theories and the world of the unconscious, an alternative world. But Latin Americans didn't need to go looking in that world because reality itself in Latin America was a magical, it was marvelous. And that's where the magical realism is introduced. What is real in Latin America is in itself magic. And that persistence of the myth that he talked about is a fundamental part of idiosyncrasy as Latin Americans. And these three characters here are very, are most interested in Macandal on the extreme left. Because Macandal, if you can, I give you a kind of a summary. He's a le Haitian legend. Macandal was an African who was enslaved and was a leader. And he lost an arm in while he was working at the sugar plantation, he escaped, he became a fugitive, he became a cimarron, and became a disciple of a black woman who was a shaman. And she showed him the ability to transform into various animals and also taught him the the herbal arts. And he became an expert 
And and so Makandal went back to the plantation and he poisons the water in the plantation. He tells us, how do you go back? You go back transforming into a bird or a butterfly or insect. He goes to their barracks and say, don't drink the water because it's poisoned. And then the whites start to die, the plantation owners, and the animals in the plantation start to die. And this is a legend, this is a legend. But it said the antecedent of the Haitian Revolution was the first revolution, was the first Latin American revolution in Haiti. We have to thank them greatly for that. But the first Latin American revolution in one way or another, was the precedent of this uh, cry of war of Bacandal. So, so we can say that in the origin, the first Latin American origin, well, the, the ideas of the illustration was present. Also, magical realist element was present as, as a seed of that rebellion as to what we are as Latin Americans, as people who are mestiza, creole, who rebel against the oppression of the European empires. Those three images are very impressive because of the stories behind them, the way you've represented them. Yes, my, and we have them in the back here. And right close to them are these other two, which we put together. There is a play here of similarities between the two, even though they're, very, even though they're different. Those were the two first ones of this collection. I say there were others, but they're not included here. But these were the first two works, the, the oldest of this collection. And if you'll notice in the top of each of each character, there's a stamp, there's a design, just product of a stamp from some wood blocks, which I collect from India. They used to stamp cloth, and I started to play with that. It was all part of a game, and by game, it's a, like, the word has importance, not just in this work, but also a great part of my work. There's the element of play is present. I'm someone who's an artist who I might cause the impression that these works are thought through, and I think of them a lot, even though I have thought about them, it really their thoughts afterwards or afterthoughts. A lot of times it's in the process that dictates the path that the work is going to follow. And that's what happened with these two works here. This is the creative process as my teacher. I'm very vigilant to what's going on with the mistakes. And one decision leads me to the other. So part of the enjoyment of working is that I don't have ahead of time planned what the end is going to be. The end is a surprise. There's times when I stop, and that's the moment when it's a mix of reason and intuition and reason and emotion. There's a balance there. You can't really explain it. It has to do with that uh, attitude of play. And Robert Louis, Stevenson, Robert Louis Stevenson said, art is a game, but you have to play it with the seriousness that children play. <laughs> children play with a lot of seriousness. You really, it's an act of faith. You have to believe in it. Yes, I think in these drawings, and, and accompanied by the texts, they have that connecting thread of imagining those moments of transition where there's also space for the imagination. Not all themes have to be stamps. Some of them are absurd. And some of these stories can be read that way. So I want to leave some time now for those who are with us here tonight can ask questions or make comments. These are the last two images, which is the Guilherme and Shalambalam, 
they also cause a deep impression and we place them together and then they're even doubly impactful. If you'd like to say something briefly, Rafi, before we go to Q&A. Well, each one is a long story, but we could talk Gollum, which is a legend. There's a medieval element from the Jewish neighborhood in Prague. It's a legend which talks about this character who's a rabbi. A rabbi. And this rabbi built some figures, a clay figure by the by the river. This clay figure pronounced some words from the Kabbalah and it took life. And little by little, he trained that figure and he called, referred to it as the golem, which means batter. And the legend says that this rabbi was able to train and take it to the synagogue and train it in some, some way to be able to sweep the synagogue, kind of his personal slave. And the legend says that Gollum is a character. But tourism nowadays, you go, you get yourself a Gollum and everything. He's a tourist figurine now. He's a very well-known character. But it's interesting. He generated a, a, quite a bit of literature. And in this particular case, Victor Medi, who's a writer, Austrian writer, he works on a legend, a very complex novel, really. It's a hermeneutic novel that st starts the way it ends. It's a present that's there always, but never appears. I could have said there's a poem from Borges that talks about the golem in one of his great poems. It's an extraordinary poem. He ends up talking about God. He's looking at his rabbi. And the rabbi looks at his golem. He says, what would God think? What emotion? What God be thinking when he looks at his rabbi? The same way the rabbi is feeling that emotion when he looks at his gold. And it's kind of a great metaphor for the creative process. That's why I'm so interested in it. The creator and his work, the artist and his model. And many times, in the case of the legend, just to finish up, the golem rebels and kills the creator. And this type of moral when the human being tries to be like God, and then you have your punishment. But it also speaks to that relationship, that complex and mysterious relationship that exists between the artist and his creation. We talked about the death of the honor about Ronald Marx. So it's kind of the creation of the artist, and there comes a time and it swallows the artist, and the work has more life and transcends the artist. It's a very interesting topic. I've been reading and I realized that the word robot is a Swedish art. And the golem, which is considered the, the, the precursor of novels like Frankenstein and others like that, the Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, all of these stem from this original legend where the human being creates, is capable of creating a life, it creates for himself a type of image, a kind of mirror, but that mirror is, is dangerous. And this is very, uh, that they talk with, you know, now they have artificial intelligence and clones, there are all sorts of issues of bioethics involved here. Is it really licit for the human beings to be creating clones? You see that in China, they've already created. They don't have the same legal limits, and they've created human beings based on cells. And the issue of artificial intelligence, which was... Also, a very well-known topic is 2001 Space Odyssey. 2001 was, it was a computer, which at the end, when it discovers that it's been deceived, it starts to destroy the astronauts that are up there on that trip. 
in that space here. But, so this is even though it's a medieval topic, it's still very up to date <laughs> because we're facing those ethical dilemmas which were touched upon by the golem. We're still seeing them nowadays. Okay, I think that's one of the marvels of the text that you've selected for this sample. And I, even though many of them are specific to a culture of a country or a particular historical moment, they have a universal resonance in terms of its, its topics and the application of those topics to our present reality. In fact, the other image that you see, the golem is one of the loosest, most spontaneous images. There's a challenge to work on. What I did was make this stain. There was an acrylic stain. I, had so, I was afraid that the oil would create that grease stain that I mentioned earlier. So I took that black black that has a bit of brown and a little bit of blue and I made the silhouette this shadowy silhouette kind of trying to evoke clay and if you get closer to the drawing this photograph I said the one I sent first where it's missing the phrases that's written in Hebrew and I'm playing with uh, upside down, kind of inverting the human being. And if you approach, get closer, you'll see that the stain has some veins, some marks of the brush, which I used to create the features of the golem's face. And I did that with white tank. I started to create the lights and shadows to give the features that are kind of also appearing and disappearing. And then finally, I'm missing an element to complete the work. I did kind of a harakiri, I say, which is a big risk. I took a huge risk. Took a large amount of Oil, red oil paint, and I just throw that red stain on there. Marvelous. It's a, you relate to it viscerally, and it's also exhibited next to Shalom Balam, which is also a beautiful image. And I, when I look at the quote that accompanies that work, we've had quite a few conversations in the museum halls about the resonances that to our parents at time. Exactly. Yes, that's the way to. All right. Well, let's let people ask questions. If there's something, yes, let's do that so we can receive some questions. I wanted to mention that the exhibition is accompanied by a catalog, bilingual, totally illustrated with all 15 works that are exhibited in the museum. So you can navigate the museum in a virtual tour if you like, if you can't come here personally, and you can go to our internet page. So, so I'm going to pause our PowerPoint image here. And I have several questions, Rafi, for you. Okay. What made you choose blue? Is Kafka's work related to the Mac uh, exhibition or is it different? To which is it the Mac? Uh, are you referring to the Museum of Contemporary Art Puerto Rico? No, it has nothing to do with the MAC. The blue is there for two reasons. First of all, the Maya prisoners who were going to be sacrificed, it was an honor to be sacrificed. They were going to directly to the kingdom of the gods. I forget which name it was, but they were painted in blue uh, before they were sacrificed. But in addition to that, the Mayan blue is something very important because when the Europeans arrived in Mexico, they were surprised that blue in Mexican art was very common. And they had blue backgrounds. For example, the murals in the Maya Findings. You see, there's a lot of blue. In that time in Europe, blue was the most scarce color. 
you hardly see it in painting because to make blue, the lasting source was lapis lazuli, and it had to be ground, and it was very costly. Only people who had a lot of money who, who worked on the mantles of the Virgin and stuff. It was very costly, the lapis lazuli. So you're going to see that there's almost no blue in your painting of that era. And they're surprised that there's this, so much blue and lasting blue. And the, they, the Mayas got this blue from some mind which still exists in Yucatan. From there, they used to extract. They call it, see if I can remember. It's also used to make soap. It's a vegetable tint. But that vegetable tint it's not indigo. That blue, they would mix it. It still exists. They would mix it with some minerals, which gave it permanence. And they were able to get varieties of blue from blue to green, and they got it to be permanent. So it's also kind of an homage to Mayan blue, to that Mexican blue, which is uh, uh, artistic conquest you know, by Mexico and of the Americas, of us Latin Americans, where we were way ahead of the Europeans in many senses. And in their myopic view, they thought they were arriving in a country who was underdeveloped to these savages. Though we know that for the first impressions, of course, it was a fabulous city, but that wasn't that way. And one of the great conquests for an artist was to be able to get that blue. Another interesting question here, Camila says, you've mentioned in the beginning that the intention of these drawings is not to make an illustration of the text. If an author wanted you to represent one of his works in a realist way, would this be of interest to you as an artist, or would it limit your creative process too much? Well, I'm really not too interested in that. And I say it not as if I were a virtual. And in fact, it's a great limitation. I admire artists who, who can base themselves on the work of a writer or they get commissioned to do something a great part of the western work is the commission and it was limited by some demands made by the clients and some of the great master works of art like Velasquez when he paid to submit these were first or we get to Goya, who was the first modern artist who, because he was the first one who created a body of work, which responded to his interest and to his comments on reality. Before that, artists made great works of art, masterful work. They had to deal with the difficulties imposed by commissions. And I consider this great uh, mastery of great ability in my case i don't i don't have that so i, I say it as a limitation as a frustration but i'm too used to working on my own imagination i'm also for example put a, we have a great tradition of posters and i admire all of those puerto rican artists who were able to overcome the limitations that might be imposed in, in a poster and in announcing an activity or whatever. And even so, they used that limitation to create works of art. They were, they were great works of art, masterful works, autonomous. And, and and you care not too much about what they're illustrating, you care more about their artistic value. The previous question they mentioned that were related to the works, that there's a broader selection than what we're showing at the Rollins Museum was recently, I believe, in the summer, in the museum, in the Las Americas Museum of Art. Maybe she was mixed, confusing him with the Museum of Art. Some of those that we have exhibited here were at the Museo de las Américas, and then we brought them up here. Museo de las Américas was 22 in the works. We brought 15 because of space criteria. 
For nothing. Just to do my way of closing because we're reaching our time limit for the event. What would you like our students and our visitors from the community take away of this exhibition in general terms? Well, in the spirit of what we've been talking about throughout our conversation, I would like for them to take with them the confidence that the spectator is a co-creator. As Maxime Duchamp is the uh, hero of many artists, a young artist, Maxime Duchamp said, he said, let's see, I remember, he said, against all opinions, the true creators of works are not the painters, but the spectators. So he also spoke about that active role that the spectator has. But the spectator, I would tell students and I tell the people in general, have confidence. The works of art are there for you to project yourself. Each one of you, with your own experiences, with your, and you have the freedom, and you should do it. Have the confidence you have to freely interpret works of art. That's why works of art remain. And that's why they remain over the course of time. That's what we call the classics. The classics precisely because they're works that allow themselves to be interpreted, not just by their contemporaries, but through various periods of time we continue to interpret the great classics. El Quijote is, uh, means very different things than what it meant for the readers of Cervantes' time. That is because of their works that allow, that have the polysemia, they have multiple meanings, multiple interpretations. Now, in order to do this and do it in a way that's rich, you have to have two ingredients. You have to have a lot of references. You have to read a lot because artists deal with a lot of different references, literary references or references from the contemporary reality. If they're not available to you, then you can't really exercise that of active contemplation, which is, again, of playing with the word, playing with it to see what the artist meant to say. A lot of times we get locked into or get obsessed with that question. What did the artist mean? Don't think so much of that. What does it mean to me? And that is where the work continues to be alive in the mind of each one of the spectators. So with that final thought, Rafi, we thank you for those words for our students and for our visitors of all ages and all people that come to the museum, all the entire public. We're going to be there through December 31st. I want to thank you. I want to thank once again Laura Galvan for her cooperation and facilitating this exhibition, making it possible and, and getting the catalog to our entire team here at our institution. Also to all those who are with us tonight in this this conversation has been recorded. It's going to be on YouTube channel, so you can share it with your friends. And, and admission is always free for everyone year-round. Thank you to Juan. Thank you to Juan Segarra, who's been interpreting into English for doing the simultaneous translation to English. Thank you, Juan, for making these talks available to a greater public. So, we close with this. Thank you, Rafi. Good evening. Good evening.